At Kino Mutual Group, we believe that a brighter financial future should be accessible to everyone. That's really important. Kino Mutual Group and its foundation has a long-standing history of investing in the community where we have a footprint. Every year we're averaging at least 9,000, 10,000 uh, volunteer hours that are reported and recorded. But each one of those community members always says to me, with the employees, with the leadership at Kino Mutual Group, you all authentically show up. The fact that you do support your employees. That shows that you are invested in the community. There is something so special about doing something as a collective whole where you have these shared experiences. It is worth it. Not was, it is worth it. for her dreams policy from American Family Insurance. Insure carefully, dream fearlessly. Hi, I'm Kim Sponham, CEO and President of Summit Credit Union. We are so excited to sponsor another Madison 365 Women's Leadership Summit. Women's financial health is especially important to us at Summit Credit Union, and we've focused on it for more than a decade. Women are twice as likely as men to associate negative emotions with their finances, and it's no mystery why. Women still earn less than men for a variety of reasons. Women have less saved for retirement, and they're almost half as likely to invest in the stock market when compared to their male counterparts. But we're also worse than ever before, and we know from experience that women with higher levels of financial literacy tend to save more, spend more wisely, and invest more than their peers. I encourage you to use this conference as an opportunity to improve your own financial literacy and find inspiration in the incredible women joining us today. Thank you for letting us be a part of your journey. Welcome everyone to our panelists and our audience to the opening uh, panel of the second annual Women's Leadership Summit. Uh, my name is Abba Tucker and I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. We're streaming live on Facebook and LinkedIn and it's been made available to everyone thanks to our sponsors. So in today's discussion, we are going to be celebrating the intersections of women in color and the arts. Thank you, first of all, to the Women's Leadership Summit team and Madison 365 for making this possible. Such an amazing topic and the team always provides fantastic support in making it easy for all of us to participate. So I just wanna shout out to all of you. I am so excited to be to have the opportunity to talk with these particular women. Um, this is an area that I claim no expertise in, so I am just, really excited to learn from and have a terrific conversation with women who use art as a practice uh, in their self-expression and healing in the work that they do. Um, before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that we just celebrated Juneteenth and that it's incredibly exciting that that's finally becoming a mainstream holiday. And I know like several places actually are have off today and give their employees paid leave. And so yay for that. And I think this is a terrific topic to be uh, talking about in the wake of that celebration. Um, and also, if any of our audience members have questions, please ask them in the Facebook live chat or in LinkedIn, and they'll be conveyed to us, and we'll integrate them throughout our conversation. So I'm going to shift it over and now let our panelists introduce themselves. 
Um, I'm going to first uh, ask Opal if you'd like to start, and then if you want to pass it along to Kim and Lolita, to tell us about yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you um, so much for having me. And I echo everything you said um, about Madison 365 and for making this space. I was so excited when I hear, heard about this panel uh, because it is near and dear to my heart, soul, and essence of just who I am. So my name is Opal Louisa Tomaszewska. I am a poet, spoken word artist, uh, MC, um, recently became an author, uh, and just someone who, um, when it comes to my work, um, social justice, um, inequity, those things just rise to the top. This is, the, I use my art as a way of dealing with things that my mind can't process that make no sense um, to me. So I'm able to find the words um, through poetry and find the healing um, for myself and others as well. So thanks so much for having me on this panel today. Great. Thank you so much, Opal. Kim, would you like to go next and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Kimberly Lone Tree. I am a musician, cellist, and pianist. Uh, and I'm also a former executive director of personnel for the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, current business owner. I own a coffee roastery with my husband, and we are set to open in July. So very excited about that. Um, I was very intrigued and very excited to be asked to join this panel um, for many of the same reasons that were just mentioned, <laughs> uh, but also because it's a way of, of healing and escape for me as well with music and art. Um, it's an unbiased, I feel like in, in many respects, like an unbiased way of, of being able to express myself, um, but also to understand how others express themselves and to learn about others. Uh, so I very much appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Um, and I will pass it on to our next panelist. Hello, everyone. I am Lelita G. I'm really happy to be a part of this space today and excited to introduce myself as an artist. I wear a lot of hats, but that's the hat that I'm most excited about at this season of my life. And art really came to me as a little girl trying to make sense out of a world that did not make sense. And later found out that really a lot of the things that I did when I was living, you know, through trauma um, as a little girl was really healing, you know, and um, art came back to me uh, many decades later when I was doing trauma work with little girls who had gone through the same type of trauma that I had endured and needed an outlet to kind of pass through the pain, you know, um, and in, in, in so doing, I felt like those same young girls gave me a gift and gave art back to me. And I love to use my art to amplify the worth of Black girls, first to them and then to others around them, to see their images, to see that they're little girls, and to see that they need defending and deserve it. Well, thank you, all of you, for such beautiful introductions. I think our audience can see uh, what a treat we're in for <laughs> to hear from these women. Um, so I'm just going to launch into our questions. Um, we, uh, you know, have been kind of talking about the areas that that matter to these particular artists and practitioners. And so um, we're first going to talk about identity. Um, we're seeing a generation of women of color finding themselves, their identities, and their voice through the arts in music, poetry, visual arts, et cetera. Can you share how all your intersectional identities, being a person of color, a woman, et cetera, show up in your work specifically? Um, maybe we'll have uh, Kimberly start. Sure. Um, so I guess I should give a little background on my. My, my history with music, I guess. Um, so I started when I was 10, um, playing cello and piano at the same time. I also was a dancer, <laughs> um, but I ended up kind of stepping away from dance um, and then going into music full time because it was something I was a little bit more passionate about. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I, I worked my, my butt off 
to get to where I could. I went to all these different summer camps, um, progressively started getting farther and farther away from home. Um, and I eventually left home at 15 to go spend my junior and senior years of high school at Interlock and Arts Academy um, in Michigan and did that in cello performance. So I, I kind of made a choice. I had to make a choice and, and cello was where I went. Um, and then from there, I went to Baldwin Wallace Conservatory for a year before I ended up transferring on a presidential scholarship to the Berklee College of Music in Boston. Um, that's where I got my bachelor's degree. Uh, it was a, a very interesting um, experience. I would have to say I'd endure a lot, um, just like in general. It's a city. I'm very far away from home. I you know, had only so much money to work with and, uh, you know, just trying to kind of get used to the city life. And so while I was there, I ended up doing a lot of touring, um, recording and going classes, et cetera. I met my husband <laughs> while I was at Berkeley, um, uh, when I got asked to play for the deer hunter and, that's yeah. I mean, that's history now, you know, like we're, we're 10 years into our marriage. So that's awesome. And, uh, and he's currently doing a summer camp in, in, uh, I think upstate New York right now with his band, they do a summer camp every year. So just a little shout out to him. But then afterwards, um, I ended up opening a, a music teaching business. So I, I educated youth in Rhode Island, all over Rhode Island, which is where I ended up moving to about partway through my degree. Um, and I did that for several years. I enjoyed it. Um, I had many students who were very, very passionate about music and one who ended up, she's in college now for it. She's doing cello and she's pretty much my, my spitting image. Um, and I ended up going to University of Miami Frost School of Music. So I moved to Miami, Florida and got my master's there. Uh, it was a very, very cool experience. I really, really liked that school. Um, had great professors, great program director. Um, moved to Nashville to go do uh, an internship with William Morris Endeavor. And then I ended up moving back to Wisconsin to take a position as the executive director of personnel with the Ho-Chunk Nation, which is my tribe. Um, I am Korean and Ho-Chunk as well as white. So I'm a, I'm a mix of all different things. Um, but I identify mostly with my Ho-Chunk heritage because that's who I grew up with. Um, and that's kind of the, the beliefs and values that were really instilled in me was from that side of the family. So um, that's, I think, some people, when they look at me, they're kind of like, but you look really Asian. And I'm like, well, I, I mean, technically I, I kind of am, you know, they, you know, went back in history and kind of connect, you know, our, our Native Americans to Asians um, way back, you know, Bering Strait, et cetera. I'm not a historian, so I'm just giving you little tidbits here and there. But um, so, you know, my features kind of come out very, very Asian. Um, and I struggled a lot. So giving that history of myself and where I came from with music, uh, you know, I struggled a lot growing up because I grew in, in mainly white, you know, neighborhoods with, with mainly white people. And I was the only one who was, who was different. So I had to work harder. I had to make sure that I did things as best as I could so that I could achieve greater things and, and, be noticed. Um, otherwise, I would just kind of be like that, you know, non-white kid who is in this community. And uh, I did get bullied a lot when I was younger, uh, still experience it as an adult. Um, you know, racist attacks, that happens at least like a couple times a year to me that are pretty blatant. Um, so with, with music, with art, it's just been this really great escape for me, um, a way for me to identify who I am uh, and a way for me to express, you know, my understanding of the world, my understanding of everything that's happened around me um, and to create a neutral ground, if that makes sense. 
So a way of us to connect between each other. Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> if if you want to want me to clarify anything, just let me know. No, thank you for sharing and for kind of giving us context about how your identity has shaped um, the centrality of music and art in your life. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank Valeda, you. would you like to go next? Would you please repeat the question? Absolutely. And for the panelists, I'm actually going to put them in chat. In, in the chat box in case that's helpful, just so that you can get a visual as well. Can you share how all of your intersectional identities, being a person of color, a woman, et cetera, show up in your work? You know, I think as, as I look at identity, the thing that happens first for me is that I'm black and then I'm a woman. Um, and, and then I think the woman comes back to my black experience, really being black and being a woman and wanting to bring forth these images in my art that we don't often see. You know, I go into a doctor's office here. I grew up here in Madison. I go into a doctor's office growing up in the schools that I attended, Lapham, Lincoln West High School even on UW campus, not seeing images that reflected me, you know, reflected folks like me, and understanding that when you are establishing identity, part of that is getting a sense of what you look like to yourself and what you look like to the world. And that is central to my art, you know, really embracing, again, the fact that I'm Black, um, and then looking at the lens of what is the Black experience for both Black girls and Black women and wanting to shine that through. And as I, you know, began my work with Defending Black Girlhood, you know, I was thinking, how do I integrate my art? Because when I started back on my journey as an artist um, in, in my latter years, about four years ago, it was for just myself. It wasn't for public consumption. And as things would have it, you know, people who were looking over your shoulder and saying, what are you doing? You know, my art came, came forward was how do I give the foundation of what I feel is the, the, the combination of all my life's work is defending Black girlhood. How do I show that in art? And what I decided was I wanted to show images of how Black girls deserve to be. You know, they deserve to be girls. They deserve to be innocent. They deserve to be joyous. You know, I use yellow as a common theme in my colors, the, the brightness of it, the joy of it. And, and that's really where I center on that. And I have had white people ask me, well, can you do white images, which um, <laughs> there aren't enough. <laughs> And, and, and my foundation is really, you know, there's not, to me, there's not enough Black women um, having the stage to do art. There's a lot of Black women artists out there, but we are not necessarily afforded the stage, the platforms, and the canvases to really get our art out there. So thank you, but I'm going to go ahead and keep on doing Black women. Wow, thank you, Lilita, for speaking truth. <laughs> That's that was powerful and a wonderful, you know, I think, um, foundation for our conversation. Thank you. Um, Opal, um, can you share how your intersectional identities show up in your work? Yeah, for sure. And I also just need to share that I can't help but say yes um, to that. I echo, I echo that. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so for me, just... Uh, I bring my unique point of view. So I'm a spoken word artist. So I, I get to use words and rhythm and, and emotion um, and inflection when I speak. And my roots of that started in hip hop. So it, it actually, I was like a battle rapper. Um, and so I was often almost only the only girl, almost always, right? So right there, I was always someone who had a different voice, but also trying to prove that I could hang with the boys. I could beat the boys um, in these battles. And also have that femininity, also have, you know, a softer voice, also be the one who would speak for the girls, because there are, there are just as many girls in those hip-hop crowds as boys, but nobody was speaking for them. Uh, so now, 
as I'm doing spoken word, um, that's another piece that I am able to bring into it too. So that feminine side, that woman side, I can just um, firsthand speak on so much. And also it's just, it's unfiltered um, because this is an art form that is birthed in blackness. And I don't have to, as Lloyd was saying, like, I don't have to whiten it up. There's no, there's no whiteness in this. It is just what comes from me and comes from my soul. And so my intersections as as a woman, as a black woman, as a biracial black woman, uh, as someone who spent you know more than half of their life in poverty, but now as someone who is in the upper upper middle class, someone um, who has um, been you know labeled as a ghetto Wexford kid, and to someone who now has a master's degree. So being able to give all those different points of views in my words um, and spoken word, people seem to listen to, more crowds seem to listen to, and I don't think hip hop has ever gotten its justice on how brilliant it is, how you have, what you have, what has to go on in your mind to put those words together? What has to go on in your mind? Because you're never saying one thing, you're saying two and three different things. And if you're smart, you can catch the fourth thing that someone is saying in hip hop, right? I, it's always in my mind, in my experience, been so disrespected as an art form. So I find that spoken word allows me to slow it down and put it in places where people have to sit with it and they have to get that you are really saying something. And being able to, I think, have those, you know, first person because of my identities, um, different points of view. Like I have a piece called I Dream in Color, and that piece is really um, about telling the mentorship story, but from someone who has been a mentee and is still a mentee and someone who's also a mentor, but being able to have the emotions that go into both of that, the desperation when you just need somebody to pour into you, you just need somebody to give you a chance. But then also having someone who has a whole bunch of stuff on their plate and deciding, if, if, do I have time for this? And then also knowing that this is something that will feed me. I can't go further unless I'm reaching back at all because that just won't fulfill my soul. So all of those pieces come to life in my art and in the world that we live in, there's so many places that we can't, I can't bring all of me, can't bring all of me because it's not accepted. Or if I do bring all of me, it's not valued and I have to, I don't have to, but I do feel and I question it. Um, so with my art, like I don't, I don't change it up. I do want to know, you know, if someone asked me to create a piece for something specific, I do want to know who's in the audience, but it's not going to cater what I say. Um, it's going to just enhance. So um, all of that just really come through me. And I really do feel that um, just like the others have said, it's my release, it's my therapy, and it's the place that I'm truly me. And I don't, as most of us women of color, we don't get to truly be all we are in many spaces. Um, and so the art piece lets me be able to do that. Thank you so much, Opal, for speaking to the complexity of all of our identities, right? Like there's just so many, and and our changing identities. We aren't who, I, you know, I think the power of, of artistic expression is it is when we give ourselves permission to let it evolve with us, right? And so um, this next question, you've also, you've spoken to this in different ways, but I, I want to highlight it because I think it is such a key part of what art can do that other, you know, mediums may struggle with is around um, resisting erasure, right? So as women, as women of color, like as you've spoken to, we are invisible a lot of the time, unless we are fighting not to be, right? And so how, what work have you done to retell and reframe narratives about yourself, your experiences, your bodies, and and how has art helped you resist erasure for yourself and others? Um, maybe have we'll have Lilita start with this one. That's such a powerful question. Um, while yet you still have the choice to decide whether or not you will remain that. And I think that's something that's powerful for us as artists and just individuals to understand that your voice, through your expression, you have the power to establish who you are, your point of view, what you need to say, what you need to share to the world. I had, as an artist, was being a part of the State Street mural project. Um, you know, I came in when Karen Wolf called me up and said, hey, would you like to paint a mural? I was like, sure. I didn't own a brush. I had not painted, because I do digital art. I had not painted canvas probably since I was in middle school. But I knew that it was a critical moment, and I knew it was something I needed 
up with her. I called up my goddaughter, Cassie Marzette. I was like, Cassie, I don't know what I'm doing. Where by the time we were done, I had a gathered a team of Black women and girls. And together, we painted about 10 murals. And the boldness of Blackness that we, that we put up there, you know, big, bold pictures of Black girls, of Black women, multiple pictures, the, the yellow, just the unapologetic element of it is what got me started with saying, you know, um, here we are. Here we are. And I saw how that impacted people. Um, but then at the same time, you know, when I was down on, on campus, there were a lot of white people who would come by who would have, who would have um, comments while we were painting. And, and I remember one person saying, oh, I'm just so glad you're doing this instead of just being angry and out here. And I told someone, I said, you know, um, I am angry. That's why I'm painting this big ass face of this black girl, because I want it all up in your face. Okay. Anger can be expressed in many ways and don't, don't get it. Paintbrush in my hand doesn't mean that um, what I'm doing is not warfare. And so I, I, I feel that's what I feel my, my, my work in the images brings down the strongholds that black girls don't count. When we're looking at the number of black girls, speaking about erasing, I mean, the black girls that are going missing nationwide. Um, I feel like my images help to say here they are and they need to be seen, they need to be accounted for, and they need to be taken care of and defended. Thank you, Laleda. And thank you really for the work you did on State Street, right? I just want to say like it was such a critical um, sort of capstone to that whole experience to have that art really express the depth of of emotion and power that you know that 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 whole period was about and so um thank you for just engaging with that and giving thank us you. that if i could just add a tad bit on and i appreciate that so much it was such a gift Maya Pearson and I and the team, my daughter as well, Alexandra, worked on on State Street. This double side image of a Black girl and a Black woman that was just huge. And it was really interesting to me that a video was produced by a choreographer of a woman dancing in front of that image. And speaking of eraser, <laughs> it always dawned on me very ironic that this, this man of color um, choreographed this dance and had a white woman dance in front of that. And I don't know him, but I, I, I thought, what the hell? So like, what the hell? And that, and that is the reality for us of women of color, that even when you are bold and beautiful about what you've done, someone else feels that they still need to add a white interpretation to your work. Thank you. Thank you for like, you know, elevating that example, because I think the, the co-option of our identities and of our art and all of it, right, is like a constant, um, it's just a constant threat. It's like, how do we put ourselves out there and sort of like reinterpreted from us and that actually we can let's talk about that a little bit more down the down the line we have a question around that but thank you um opal would you like to speak to this about how art has helped you and others resist erasure and you you did already speak a little bit to this but anything else you'd like to share yeah, I'll just add a little more. I think just the, the first piece is just being able to tell our stories as is, uh, because when other folks tell it, it's going to be wrong. Um, and it often is so wrong that it paints us in a horrible light. Like it never actually shows us as human. It may show one aspect of us. Um, but being able to tell our own stories really lets us do it in the right way and how it really happened. Um, and for me too, just um, when I think about like the grand scheme of things, like I wrote things, I recorded things that will be here long after I'm gone. Right. I can, I can work at a job and I can do work really hard and I can make impact and it can be something that's real. But when people will look at my art, they'll know exactly what I thought 
exactly what I felt, how these things were true. We think of all the ways that now even the school system, they're rewriting history or just omitting whole pieces of history. Um, that art still tells those stories. That art still tells those feelings and those truths. And it's, it's undeniable. And in addition to that, just, you know, the, the piece that the lady was speaking on with the anger, like I get to be, I get to be angry. Like I, I, I will yell sometimes. I will, my voice will quiver. I will be vulnerable. I will be scared. Like I get to show those emotions um, that we've been taught, whether it's because we're people of color, because we're black, because we're women, um, because we're at a certain status or because we're in a certain place that we don't get to bring. And when you're able to use art and bring that, you know, to people, write to people and they can't deny it. Um, not only is it me letting my truth out, but I find that art puts people in a space of receiving where if I just said that, or if I had a PowerPoint up and I was speaking to it, it goes over, pe goes over people's heads or they have, you know, 15 rebuttals. But when you're doing it in a way that puts something in an, uh, someone in an emotional state to receive it through art the way art does, they can't deny it. And it resonates with souls. And um, people will tell you that. People will come up to you and sometimes they don't know what to say, but they're like, I just need to come say something. Um, because it actually kind of breaks through places where I find that um, without the art, without the emotion, without the rhythm, um, without people getting in this you know, posture to receive, that they just can't take it. So as far as it, you know, it just, I was here. That's how I feel like with my art. So when you're talking about erasure, like this is me, I was here, no one can take it. Like that's, that's mine. And especially with so many of us who've had so much taken away or who were born with, you know, quote unquote, nothing to have with us or who don't own property. Like you own your intellectual property and you own your art and that is yours and your name is on it. Um, that's a feeling I can't explain. And that's, like I said, that that's what's permanent about me. That's going to be what's permanent about me is going to be my art. Ah, so much that you, that you women are bringing here. Thank you so much. I just, I want to just name like that piece around anger that both of you spoke to, right? That our anger is seen as dangerous and unallowed or unhinged, right? And and that's not fair. I mean, it's an emotion that everybody gets to have, especially when you've been in a position of being constantly marginalized and made invisible. And so, um, so art is that, is that vehicle, right? That like, you know, as you said, like puts people in a position of being able to receive now that should just always be okay, but maybe art is that bridge, right? That like, maybe that's how we um, start to like have ourselves heard and seen in the fullness of our emotional range, whether it's anger or joy, which we are also allowed. Um, and so thank you. Um, so Kim, do you want to speak to how art has helped you and others resist erasure, how you've used it to reframe stories about yourself? Sure. Yeah. I actually kind of want to add on more <laughs> to what I've been hearing because it's all really, really great. Um, talking about erasure is like, you know, our missing and murdered indigenous women, for example, um, those are women that are typically swept under the rug, except by, you know, our indigenous peoples who are like, Hey, we need to keep saying their names out loud. We need to keep putting this in your face and telling you that these people are missing, like something's happening to them. Um, so I think about that a lot. I think about, our language, um, with the Ho-Chunk language too, you know, we were very close to losing it. Um, my, my grandfather knew how to speak, uh, and sorry, it looked like you, <laughs> you froze for a second. Um, my, my grandfather knew how to speak. I knew my great grandparents, uh, Sam and Ann Lone Tree who were very prominent, um, in the native American church and in our tribe. Um, you know, hearing them speak was was incredible, but um, a lot of them, I think, lost their language in part. I'm not saying that every single one, but in part because, you know, English is the, the, the first language here. And so we're kind of taught um, in schools and, and in our communities, just if you don't speak English, then you need to get out of here. Right. And I think that is just disgusting. I absolutely hate that statement. Um, you know, we didn't start this country 
with the English language. We started with indigenous languages and we need to remember that. And then we're also a melting pot. So all these different people are here. My mom is an immigrant and my mom spoke Korean. She didn't teach my brother and I how to speak Korean fluently because she wanted us to have an easier life. You know, we're going to be Americans. We're here. We're, we're mixed race. And she didn't want us to get picked on any more than we were going to for how we look. So, you know, that kind of stuff makes me really, really sad, um, scared for our future sometimes. But What's awesome is that when you can find those other individuals who are in your, uh, in your like playing field, they're on your side, they're the ones that you want to, you know, keep strong with, I think, um, in the sense that like, for example, I'll use my husband again, my husband's white, he's a, he's half Italian, half uh, English, Irish mix, <laughs> but very much white. And, um, and I had to teach him when I think in our first five years of being together, um, he too, you know, like had never really experienced racism or seen it happen to somebody else. And he kind of, you know, saw it on TV, kind of, you, you, you learn about what racism looks like, but when you're a white person, you don't really know what that's like. And we were driving through Chicago, coming to visit my family here in Wisconsin, because we were still living in Rhode Island at that time. Um, I was driving the car and this carload of kids drove up. They were probably in their late teens, drove up um, to the side of our car and then tried to get my attention went behind us and then went to the other side of the car. And um, finally I decided to look at them even though I knew it was nothing good. And they all went like this and just straight up like outside the car, like made those eyes. And I sat there livid thinking in my head, like I'm in a car, I could, <laughs> could fear this way. <laughs> like I could, you know, I could uh, cause a crash, but um I didn't, I kept my cool um, and I was shaking with anger, but my husband more surprisingly um, just sat there and apologized to me. And he said, I'm so sorry um, because he had always kind of been like, you know, you're over exaggerating a little bit. Like, you know, you, you feel like these things are happening. I, I don't see it. And I'm like, I see it, I see it happen. So when he actually saw this happening, he was like, I've been wrong. Um, I'm very sorry. I will never doubt you again. <laughs> and, you know, that was his changing moment. That was the moment that he was like, you know, I, as a white person, really don't know what racism is. I really don't know what it looks like when it's happening. And when my wife says that it's happening, I'm going to believe her. Um, so, you know, those type of things, that's where I have to sit there and I have to say, you know what? I am mixed. I am um, this individual who is from all these different races, cultures, um, beliefs, and I need to always step out. I can't just like stay in my house and be, you know, everyone's going to hate me and hurt me and, and be mean to me. I need to be aggressive about who I am. And, and that's the other word too, that I wanted to mention is we were saying angry, right? I've been called aggressive. I've been called intimidating. And it's only because I sit there and I, I say, you know, that's not right. That's not right for you to say, or I don't agree with that. Um, when someone is, is being racist or they're, they're being biased or they're, they're doing something that is just not equity in any way, you know? Uh, so I, I really think that for women like us, women of color who, you know, are called those things. We just have to remember it's just because they don't understand where we've come from, our backgrounds, our um, understandings of the world and what we've experienced. And, you know, they have some more educating to do on their ends. Um, so that's why I use my music. I've always used it as that to show people like, I, I am talented. I have things that I can do very well. I'm a very intelligent person. <laughs> uh, 
you know, and I battled with getting a master's degree for, for a little while too. While I was getting my bachelor's, I was like, I don't know if I want to get a master's and I went and got it. And I'm glad I did because I can show people. Yeah. You know, I'm not just somebody, you know, sitting around doing nothing. I'm, I'm trying to make something better of myself and, you know, show you that I, I am worth something. Um, I shouldn't have to do that though. And it reminded me of this book. If any of you have ever read it, um, this is kind of what I'll end on for this is the dance of anger. So that really brought it into perspective for me because I get a lot of angry feelings too, especially when I have to deal with um, ignorant people. And that helped me to realize like there are different pathways for you to express your anger. So doing it through our art, through our music, through anything that makes us happy and gives us a way of expressing, um, that's completely, uh, <laughs> and you have to understand it, it is a way to express your anger. It's a way to be angry <laughs> and then do it in that way. So I love that. I love that we have figured that out, that all of us have have given ourselves that pathway to express ourselves and not bottle it up and not be quiet, not be silent. Thank you, Kim. You know, I, I think what you spoke to there about how so often we have to convince people of our realities, like that this is actually happening to us or, and some, I mean, sometimes I can even feel like gaslighting, like, no, you're just making this up. Right. And so I, and, and I also appreciate what you, you know, uh, talked about around language erasure. Cause I think, I mean, that's always been a tool of colonialism. Right. And, um, and it's, something, you know, bringing language, English medium schools all over the world was like part of how the British Empire took over, right? I mean, and so, and we still see it today. We still see it today and like what's acceptable English and what's not. And that's where like, Opal, what you were talking about in terms of like how hip hop has so often been disrespected and like so much of this is about language, right? And about how we what sort of considered proper and who defines that <laughs> and that's where I think art can really help us you know redefine and challenge and push on those boundaries um, of expression I want to say we only have about 15 minutes left amazingly uh, this I knew this was never going to be enough time so before we kind of uh, go into kind of our wrap-up question I want to invite I, anyone else to kind of just share, react to each other. If there's anything that's on your mind that you'd like to share based on what you've heard, otherwise I can move into another question. Um, I just want to say quickly that Opal and uh, I don't want to pronounce your name wrong. It's Lilida. Oh my gosh, you two are awesome. Like seriously. And I am going to do anything that I can to support you in what you do. So please, if you leave a link, um, I will follow you. I will go and see your art. Um, I really appreciated everything that you've had to say. And I agree with everything. Um, it's really nice to be in a space with others that know what I've experienced um, because it, it helps to remind me it's not just a singular experience it's it's felt all around by other women of color and being a woman is very difficult I haven't spoken to that either but you know that that's difficult in the music industry as well entertainment industry um when you want to you know get a leg up on something or if you want to get a promotion or be just even paid the same amount as your male counterparts it's very difficult um I just read an article yesterday where some female musicians, um, actually it wasn't an article. It was a friend of mine. It was a friend of mine who I went to Berkeley with and she had said that she'd been turned down this last year. She can't even like count it on her hands, how many times she's been turned down because she's a female. Um, and bands just say, no, you'd ruin our aesthetic. Like we, we want, only men, like they've literally said that. And that's incredible to me, but it still happens. It's still reality. Um, thank you, Kim. I appreciate your words. Uh, I, I can't let this time pass without um, referring back to the experience that I had at the Overture Center where I was um, racially attacked. 
and Madison 365 was right there to break the story, which I really appreciate that. And really understanding that, you know, I'm part of an exhibit that's up until October, Ain't I a Woman, that having this exhibit that was created by a Black woman, all Black women artists and about Black women, that there was a stronghold against that, you know, and um, weeks after it happened, you know, finally the Wisconsin State Journal covered the story and it was the art and culture um, uh, reporter that covered the story. And I said, well, why didn't you all cover this before? Your whole focus is art and culture. How did Wisconsin State Journal not see this as a valuable story to tell that a Black woman, a Madison resident, and an artist could not get into, you know, the building to just paint? And so, um, so when we do begin to show up, when our light does begin to shine, there is a pushback against that. And then there is an ignoring of what that all means as well. And so I, I just wanted to mention that because that's something that can really take you aback. And, you know, um, I'm not sure how I would have responded when I was 25. You know, I'm, I'm 56. And so um, I have different words now that I use and different power and authority that I have in networks that I have now, you know. But I think if I was 25, that would have hit me in a way that would have made me feel really powerless. Thank you so much, Lileta, for offering that. I I am, was following your experience um, around that. I also was very grateful for Madison 365's uh, reporting on that, immediate and just always grounded. But thank you for offering and for just speaking to that because it was shocking. Uh, and it was absolute. You are absolutely right. Right, we show up, and and the pushback is immediate. It's like the the equal and opposite force, right? <laughs> um, and it's almost physics nowadays the way that that racism operates. And so, um, thank you, just for for being willing to sort of publicly talk about your story around that because I think it helps a lot of us recognize that when we go through that, that it's real and it's happening to other people too. So, um, Opal, anything you'd like to share as we, as I'm going to, we have one last question I want us to speak to, but anything you want to add? Yeah, I yeah, just want to uh, thank you, Kim, and echo you. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful to be sharing the stage uh, with both of you. Um, I admire both of you and I'm learning more. Um, Laleda, I look at you as someone who is so brave. Um, and I love that you said, like, at 25, you don't know if you would have said, um, been able to hold it the way you have and been able to speak with that authority. So I think that is so powerful that, you know, there are 25-year-old artists, right, who have, I, I can speak to some who have brought on stage street, who, right, they're seeing you do that, though. And they're, they're going to be able to absorb that and, and stand up for themselves in ways that they wouldn't before, Um you are someone who it's not just in your art either. It's in it's in you as a person that you stand up for folks um, like that. So uh, just to know that um, that's you through and through. Uh, I just thank you for being that um, for for our community. And Kim, your understanding of who you are, what you bring, and all of that is just so beautiful. Um, I'm fascinated, and I could I could listen to it all day and just love that there's so much commonality between us three, right? We've got these different backgrounds and identities, but we've all been hurt in very similar ways. Um, and as women um, have been held to um, some additional hurdles, right? That are, that are beyond our color too, which is just um, that we all have hurt and felt that way um, as well. I think it's just really nice to um, be in community with y'all because I think sometimes we are the only, um, if we're asked to be a part of a conference or a show or event, we're the only one doing what we do. And to be around other artists I have found is just healing as well. So I just wanna um, just echo the admiration here and just so grateful for all that y'all do. And I wanna continue connecting and learning about the things that you bring to the spaces as well. That's always one of the most wonderful parts of this summit is like, is how, you know, panelists get to connect with each other and learn about what each other are doing. So I think this is a really good segue to kind of our last question. Um, what kind of support and community um, or lack thereof were critical in your trajectory um, to doing the art that you do and doing the work that you do? And 
and what kind of, um, in what ways should our community support women, right? So your experience and then what you think needs to be happening um, so that women can do this work. Uh, Opal, would you like to start? Yeah, yeah, so just say, uh, you, you can't do it alone, you can certainly create alone. And I love, I love to create alone, but as far as um, getting your work out there, I've been blessed by, you know, when it was, uh, in, in hip hop, it was, you know, love from DJs and producers um, who were able to show me love and, and wanted to work with me. And as I have continued, I mean, Madison 365 has been awesome to, to showcase um, my spoken word and, and put me in um, positions like this. And it just really is um, our community resources. I can think of uh, Capital City Hughes, um, who has been able to shine a spotlight. Um, thinking about uh, the late and great uh, Miss Nalele and M. Umoja. She was one of the first person who, you know, I was talking to her and she met me in a corporate setting but she was like, you also do spoken word and also for corporate, she was like, she's like, there's a story here. She's like, there's a story here. I'm going to get someone on it. And it, it's that piece that can really help take, you know, the stuff that you do for you in, in your journals and in your bedroom, you know, to the world and start to really have people see you. So I would say that, you know, anyone who has a platform, no matter how big or small you think it is, if you see, you know, women of color who are doing art and it touches you and it feels real, being able to lend that spotlight uh, and share with them um, is going to be huge and continue to support folks. And I think you can support folks on so many levels, right? You can do it by, you know, uh, buying their stuff, supporting their stuff, visiting their sites. Like for myself, I, you can stream stuff for me on all platforms that helps, but even without spending a dime, just sharing, liking, telling someone about someone else, right? Because there are so many, I think just in our Madison community alone, in our Wisconsin community, so many talented folks. Um, and I'm always, um, I've been on both sides of it and I look at myself, someone who get, I get the mic a lot, right? I get the mic a lot, but I have so many talented people who don't. Um, and seeing how we can put those folks on and mention their names in circles and give them opportunities uh, is huge. Um, so yeah, I would just say word of mouth is still the biggest thing. We have social media and everything else, but word of mouth, if you're actually telling somebody, hey, this artist is hot, or hey, this woman is brilliant, or hey, you know who would really be able to do some illustration for what you're talking about? This lady, you know, who will really be able to put a, a, a cello solo on this thing that will make it live, it's Kim. Um, to just do stuff like that um, and be able to have folks, you know, because as artists, you have to be trusted, right? They need, they need to know you're going to show up. That's what I often see. People get so nervous. Are you going to show up? Are you going to, is it going to fit? And when you have that trust and you use that network, that's something that can really be powerful. So I would just say, continue talking about, you know, women of color artists that are out there because we're out here, so many of us out here. Beautiful, thank you. Elevate each other, right? Absolutely. Lolita, would you like to speak to this? Definitely underscore everything that Opal just said. And I think the challenge I have is for probably two, two segments of our community. One is the Black men. Black men often get into places and spaces that Black women do not. And so my challenge to Black men is when you look around, when you have power, when you have opportunity, when you have influence, if you don't see Black women on that platform, in those spaces, then go get one. Um, my second call out is to women of color. Whenever something goes on into any community, Black women are always called upon to save the day. And when we are in need, we do not feel that same love. And so my second call is to women of color, that same thing is look around when you have opportunity, you know, are there black women there? And, and then help us get to the stage, help us get to the space, help us get into those opportunities because um, I can't, this would be a whole nother summit, but there is a special brand of racism that black women receive. Okay, and I don't have time enough to talk about that right now, but just understanding that and those of you who have power and opportunity and influence need to be aware of that. And when you don't see us there, come and find us and get us because we out here. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Centering Blackness, centering Black women. Thank you. Absolutely. Kim, anything you want to speak to around the support that was critical for you and what you think um, the community needs to. Sure. Um, first, I want to say that my parents are both like kind of my ground. They're my rock. They're, you know, everything. Um, so because of them, I'm where I am today. Uh, they, you know, 
like I said, my dad is is Ho Chunk and and white, and my mom is Korean. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for them, like I wouldn't have this appreciation and love for music and the arts. They're both artistic people as well. They just didn't end up doing that for their careers. Um, and they instilled that love and hard work in both my brother and I. Um, I would say some other inspirations were uh, some of the teachers that I had growing up. One in particular, Yu Xian Wu. I'll have to say her name out loud. I think she's in Taiwan. Um, she was studying at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and she was one of the cello teachers that I really remember and inspired me to keep going. Um, she helped me to refine my skills so that I was able to go the places that I wanted to go. Um, so I really appreciate her for that. Um, I also have, you know, this love for indigenous and, and Asian actors and musicians. Whenever I see them, I try to be very supportive, um, watch their movies, uh, documentaries, read their books, um, just try to give, you know, some time out of my day to reflecting on, on what they're expressing. Um, and I want to say, I want to underscore too everything <laughs> that has been said previously, because it's all true. Um, I say with our indigenous people, especially, um, you know, we're more than casinos and we're more than gambling. We're more than reservations. And trust me, I've had people how many times ask me if I've been raised on a reservation and not all of us are raised on reservations and those are not really, they don't have a good history. So that's, you know, what I try to educate people with and say like, you know, we're more than that. Um, we're not just in those, you know, small uh, communities, we're, we're everywhere. Um, and we might not all look indigenous, you know, with the way that people define what it looks like to look indigenous, because um, we're we're mixed. Some of us, some of us are lighter skinned. I mean, my grandpa was full blooded Ho Chunk, and he looked. Um, we had several people actually ask him if he was Japanese, so he had an Asian look. And um, you know, just remember that. Be aware of that. Um, and with Asians as well, um, you know, we're more than just the, the kid who might be really good at math. I'm actually very bad at math. <laughs> I want to say that out loud. Um, I, I hate math. Um, I was always into English because I loved writing. I loved reading. Um, that's in my blood. And I loved art and music. So that's just where I ended up. Um, and you know, look past what we look like on the outside and actually get to know us, like spend some time trying to get to know who we are as people, because we are so many different things. Um, we're supportive, we're loving, we're, we're family people. Uh, maybe we're, we're animal lovers too. I have three fur kids, like you know, they're my life and I, I love them. And, uh, you know, I love to travel and, um, I went to Hawaii for my honeymoon and I want to go back because I just absolutely love Hawaii and the people and the food. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, you know, look past that, give us a chance to, um, you know, when we apply for jobs, when we, uh, we want to perform in your facility or when we want to display our art, um, you know, give us a chance and give us that platform to show what we have because it's incredible. And uh, that's the one of the best ways I would say you can advocate for us too and show that you're on our side is by giving us that support. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you um, for your stories, your vulnerability, your sharing, your histories. Um, this has just been a really uh, lovely experience. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this very first panel for the second annual Women's Leadership Summit. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.
This is 365 Media.